Okay, welcome. Uh, today, our lesson is going to be on the Shang Dynasty. So you're going to go ahead and open up your China Notes 1 document that's posted to Classroom under China Resources. Uh, if you're in the classroom, you're going to need to get some earbuds um, or put your volume down because everyone's going to be watching the video on their own. Now, um, as you watch this video, you can pause at any time that you need to in order to fill in the notes. So I have the video going and then in another tab also have your China Notes one document so that you can go back and forth and fill in the notes as we go. All right, so today's lesson is on the Shang Dynasty. It's pronounced Shang like you hit a gong. Uh, and China's very first dynasty is the Shang Dynasty, and it developed along the banks of the Huang Ha River. And the Huang Ha River is going to be over in China, right along this area right here. Uh, you can see the Shang Dynasty by no means is the entire extent of present day China, but it is a fairly large area because we have to remember China is a almost the size of the United States, a very large country. Now they had a very strong army during the Shang Dynasty and this was due to constant warfare that they used in order to maintain their rule and expand the boundaries that they had. You can see in our picture over here, uh, the soldiers fighting in a chariot with archers and then another weapon and horses. And they use bronze weapons during this time period. Bronze is a mixture of copper and tin. We have an example of a bronze weapon down here. Um, and this was stronger than the uh, copper alone uh, weapons that they had before this. Whoever has the strongest weapons is the person who's going to win when you go to battle. So it's very important that you had the best possible technology in terms of weapons. Now, as for the social classes, the servants, animals, and slaves were buried with the king because he needed to be served in the afterlife. Um, we know that they did believe in an afterlife. And when the king was buried, it might have looked something like this. This is a picture from the textbook. We see uh, they have dug down below. And down here is almost like a burial chamber that they are decorating the walls. And this is actually where the king himself will be buried. And you see lying here, these are all the different servants and the warriors. And they even killed the horses because he's going to need those horses. This should remind you a little bit of ancient Egypt with the underground tombs that they had in the Valley of the King, kind of a similar concept here. And of course we know about this because we found it and we have excavated and found burial sites of the ancient kings that show us what they did in the ancient days. The Shang also traded a lot and they used rare seashells as a type of money, something similar to this. Uh, they did not have minted coins yet. That will not come about until a little bit later. Now the nobles, they owned all of the land and the farmers who worked on the land, they had to send a portion of their harvest to the nobles. Uh, this meant that the nobles are going to stay in that upper class, whereas the farmers are going to stay in that lower class. And the slaves, they were typically prisoners of war, and they had many different jobs that they had to do, but that included building the tombs and the palaces that we had for the king when he was to die. Now remember, if you need to go back at any point, just hit pause in the video, copy the notes that you need, and then hit play when you're ready. As for the religion, we know that they believed in an afterlife because the food and riches were buried with the king. And why would you bury the king with all those items unless you believed that they would need them in that next life? A big part of their religion in the ancient days and still continues today in parts of China is ancestor worship. There's the belief that your dead ancestors could help or hurt the living. So you need to make sure that your ancestors are happy with what you are doing. They would make offerings of food or maybe even humans in order to keep those ancestors happy. We see in our picture over here, it is um, a, 
a grave for somebody who has passed away and people have left flowers and food and candles in front of that grave as an offering. Uh, the king inherited the right to rule from his ancestors, so the king was also responsible for making sure that they were happy with what he was doing and he was ruling them rightfully and living up to the expectations of the family. So I'm going to show you an excerpt from the original Mulan movie and in the movie Mulan, soldiers come to Mulan's family and they ask for a soldier to fight in the war. Um, Mulan's father would be the who would go, but unfortunately Mulan's father is very old um, and Mulan is, is scared that he, if he goes to war, he won't come back. So she decides to take the family armor and uh, weapons and go off and fight herself in order to save the life of her father. At this point in the movie, the family has realized that Mulan has left and they are awakening the ancestors in order to watch over Mulan. Awaken. I live! So tell me what model needs my protection, great ancestor. You just say the word and I'm there. Mushu. And let me say something. Anybody who's foolish enough to threaten our family, vengeance will be mine. <laughs> Mushu. These are the family guardians. They... Protect the family. And you, oh demoted one. I ring the gong. That's right. Now, wake up the ancestors. One family reunion coming right up. Okay, people, people, look alive. Let's go. Come on, get up. Let's move it. Rise and stand. Oh, way past the beauty sleep thing. Trust me. I knew it. I knew it. That Mulan. Troublemaker from the start. Don't look at me. She gets it from your side of the family. She's just trying to help her father. Look, if she's discovered, Baju will be forever shamed. Dishonor will come to the family. Traditional values will disintegrate. Not to mention they'll lose the farm. My children never caused such trouble. They all became acupuncturists. Well, we can't all be acupuncturists. No. Your great granddaughter had to be a cross dresser. Let a guardian bring her back. Yes, awaken the most cunning. No, the swiftest. No, send the wisest. Silence! <laughs> we must send the most powerful of all. <laughs> okay, okay, I get the Jeff, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, y'all don't think I can do it? Watch this here. <laughs> Jump back, I'm pretty hot, huh? Well, maybe I had to send nobody that proved no point. You had your chance to protect the Pa family. Your misguidance led Fartain to disaster. Yeah, thanks a lot. And your point is? The point is, we will be sending a real dragon to retrieve Mulan. What? What? I'm a real dragon! You are not worthy of this spot. Now, awaken the great stone dragon. So you get back to me on the job thing. Of course, Mushu will not awaken the dragon and will try to protect Mulan on his own, which will cause a problem. Uh, as for our religion, they also had oracle bones. Now, the word oracle means some type of look into the future. Uh, so they will use those oracle bones in order to foretell the future um, and to communicate with the ancestors to help them tell the future. And these oracle bones, they were actually made from turtle shells or cow bones. So they were much wider than maybe your typical bone. And the way that you use them is the priests would take um, some type of sharp object and do some scratches into the actual bone. At first, these were just very simple scratches, and then they eventually developed into the writing. So this is how they started their writing system, was on these bones. They then placed a metal rod into a fire. The metal rod would heat up, and then they would place it onto the bone. The transfer of the heat would then cause the bone to crack. 
based on where the crack went through the bone, they would then say what the ancestor was communicating to them. So of course there was a lot of room for you to kind of interpret it the way that you wanted to interpret it. I have another video from you from a museum. We're in the Shanghai Museum and we're looking at a very early oracle bone. And this is so important because this brings us to the very beginnings of writing in ancient China. The oracle bone is on an ox scapula, so it's actually the shoulder blade here that you can see carved little tiny characters from the right to the left, all in little lines. And those characters are still, many of them, recognizable as Chinese characters today. Yeah, about today. 40% of them actually are decipherable. And we have tons of these remaining. We have about 200,000 of them. We're not really used to the idea in the West that we could read writing that's more than 3,000 years old. And of course, this is really important because you can read history through it. When we have a group of these objects together, we can look back and see how things evolved on this particular year, what kinds of concerns people had. It's an oracle bone, so mm -hmm. we know that it was something that could divine the future, that could help people understand what the future might bring. They would get these bones, they would inscribe the questions on them, and then a diviner would come and use a, a particular ritual that involved a heated rod, a metal rod, that they would touch to the bone. And the way that the cracks would evolve on the questions would divine the future. So the cracks would be read by someone who had a kind of special power. The questions were all directed toward somebody named Shang Di, the deified ancestor of the Shang royal cult. And when we're talking about the Shang dynasty, this is in the cradle of civilization, the Yellow River Valley, the capital. And the kinds of questions that people would ask would involve everything from the very mundane to ritualistic things. When should a sacrifice be performed, a particular rite of worship? This one, we're looking at a question about the bumper harvest, when to be planting. And ancestor worship was incredibly important during the Shang dynasty and that's something that will change with the next dynasty the Zhou dynasty. Yeah, when we get into the Zhou we see a different concept. Okay so you were able to see some examples of what those oracle bones look like and that they would really ask any type of question maybe when it would rain. Uh, I saw one it was uh, what type of uh, the the queen was pregnant and would she have a good pregnancy or a bad pregnancy? And the result was a bad pregnancy because she was going to give birth to a girl. So of course they preferred to have men back then, uh, baby boys and not baby girls. Uh, writing, we said that it began to develop on the oracle bones and the scratches that they made would become more advanced to become the pictographs that they still use today for their writing. They have used the same writing system. It has evolved and changed, but the same concept of the writing since the ancient times. Um, pictographs are symbols that stand for words, not just for sounds. Now, something that's very unique to China is that their spoken language varied depending on where you were. If you go to China today, uh, you could be speaking uh, Cantonese in one section, travel down maybe to Hong Kong and you might be speaking Mandarin, go out west and you could be speaking Tibetan. So to, based on where you are, there are different dialects of the language. But regardless of where you are, they all have the same written language. Um, and that's something that's able to unify a very large and diverse area. Because remember, China is about the size of the United States, so it's quite large. Now, as for their artwork, they made vases out of that bronze material that they also made their weapons and very intricate details, just like you see in our example over here. Uh, those vases have still survived till today. They also made remarkable jade jewelry. And this is an example of jade down here. It's like a milky green uh, stone. You can't see through it like you would an emerald. Um, kind of like a shamrock shake, if you ever got one of those from <laughs> McDonald's. Uh, jade is still very popular in China today. A lot of Chinese women wear jade bracelets around their wrist. The jade, the hard qualities represent wisdom, but the smooth, shiny side of it represents kindness. So two qualities in one. 
know all good things must come to the end and the Shang dynasty had constant warfare which weakened the military power. Um, when you are not at peace and you are fighting, that means you are spending less time on the people. Uh, this meant lavish spending. Um, will weaken the economy while the king was seen as being very corrupt. So you have outside people invading, you have the inside people being upset and rebelling. This makes for a very weak government and a neighboring state to them, the Zhou state. The Zhou will eventually build up in power and they will conquer the Shang dynasty. So our next lesson, we will be learning about the Zhou dynasty. Now, I hope you were able to get all of those notes down for the Shang Dynasty in your notes section. You are now going to head over to Socrative, room name, Kane MMS, and take the quiz. Use your notes document to help you while you are taking the quiz. If you do not like your score the first time, please take it again until you are happy with your score. This score will be going into the grade book. You're welcome to watch this video as many times as you need to so that you understand the concept. Uh, it was great seeing you today. Goodbye.